the telepathic <laughs> communication. Was that exactly the same way that Pi had been communicating with you in your real life? I'd been working with her and she wasn't responding to what we'd been doing as positively as she'd been in the past. And I, I couldn't figure out what was going on. The best way I can describe it is that a whole load of information came in through my solar plexus and I didn't actually know what my solar plexus was at the time or or where it was but that's where it came in yeah. um completely through me and it, it took me about three quarters of an hour to um I knew what it all meant but it took me about three quarters of an hour to, to put it into thought form so that I could explain it to my husband when I was telling him so really all of the changes she needed to make in her body which was to engage her pelvis, lift up and open and be powerful were all the changes that I had to make in order to help her to do that. We both helped each other because she would very much highlight any time I wasn't strong or I wasn't where I needed to be, she would highlight it in no uncertain terms. So that I I, I was so desperate to help and, and to be the rider she wanted me to be. I was so desperate to, to get better and to improve. I pushed myself emotionally in ways I would never have done if, if I hadn't been doing it to, to do what she needed me to do. And Welcome, Lynn Mann. Awesome Thank author. You. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> would you like to um, give us a quick introduction of you and your work? Um, I'm a British author who never intended to be an author really. I um, had the good fortune to come across a, um, I, I was going to say pie ball because that's what we call them in the UK, but you say paint, I think, don't you? A paint mare. The, black the, and horse, white mare. the horse in the photo behind you. That's actually Braveheart, that's um, Peace. Um, okay. Yeah, I'm, I'm in my husband's office, so um, he, he's got his photos of his horse around here. Um, yeah, no, um, I had the, the good fortune to uh, come across her at a rescue centre and adopted her. Um, she was with me for 18 years and taught me a huge amount, um, inspired me a huge amount, um, to the point where I couldn't contain everything she taught me. So I started to write a book. Um, I started writing it as non-fiction and it didn't feel right at all. So I just it just felt odd and blocked and strange, so I stopped. Um, and then I started to have an idea for a story based on some of our experiences inspired by other experiences. And I started to write that fictional story and that was The Horses Know, that was my first book. Um, I had no idea it was going to be received as well as it was, um, but when it was, I, I thought I'd write a sequel. Um, and that series has turned into 10 books now. I seem to have just carried on <laughs> without really meaning to or intending to. It just seems to have happened. <laughs> it's amazing that way where you've just followed, you know, your own intuition and the guidance of your horse. And then here you are doing something you never thought you'd do, having people yeah. love it, ask for more, ask when the next one is coming. <laughs> Yeah, no one, no one's more surprised than I am, <laughs> really. So as you, um, I just have your 10th book right here. All right, okay. <laughs> um, as you hit number 10, and you're still with, I mean, you jump around, you've created additional timelines, which I like the way you've given yourself extra freedom that way. But yeah. in terms of the type of book and the way the horses and the humans interact, after 10 books of this, are you yourself getting a bit, not, I mean, not really bored, but are you kind of like, oh, I kind of like to write about something else, or I'd like to do something else, or are you still fully submerged in this world? Up, up until that 10th book, I was completely submerged in that world. Um, I'm starting to think I might write about something different or, or start a go off on a tangent at some point but I'm just I think in my own mind tying up a few loose ends at the moment so I've actually I'm just coming to the end of a novella which is a spin-off story from the second book um just because those characters went off at the end of the book um and 
started to do something else and I was just curious to know what they got up to and it, it's to satisfy my own curiosity really I'm exploring I'm exploring what they did um unusually um I haven't got an outline for this story at all I just sat down and just asked myself okay what 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 did they get up to so I've been thoroughly enjoying finding out what they what they got up to um so that that's a, a novella that that um, I'll produce, and I think I've possibly got another couple that I'd like to do just um, with characters that people will or my readers will already know. Um, and then I I guess to be honest, I sh I shouldn't really say. And then I'll do X Y Z because I've thought that before. And then I I really thought the trilogy was going to be the end of it, and then I just um, had an idea and, and ran off with that, and I I just seem to have kept going. So. I, I, it's not it's not sensible for me to say and then I'll do this because I probably won't I'll probably do something else entirely so who knows maybe we maybe we'll be having this conversation again 20 books down the line <laughs> <laughs> exactly <laughs> or you'll be like well I tried to go in a different direction and my audience went saw absolutely you know crazy on me and I had to pull back and it's it's, 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 it's my audience, to be honest, it's my characters. They get in my head and don't stop until I, until I write the story that's been nagging at me. That's what's happened ever since the end of book three, when I thought I'd finished. Then, um, I just have characters. It, usually, when I wake up in the morning, as I'm waking up, <clears throat> that's when it happens, and they're just in my head doing this until I think, oh, I, oh okay, there's, there's another book that I need to write, and then I write it, and then it, and then it happens again. That that's what's been happening. Um, wow. the, the book the book you've just held up was meant to be a short story until um one of the characters got in my head and said no 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 that I, I need to do this bit and then I, I, I you know I I'm kind of writing down what I'm seeing going on in my head so you know I'm not um I'm kind of only partly responsible really <laughs> that's my story and I'm sticking to it <laughs> <laughs> so what are what words do you use to describe? that phenomena do you are you channeling in some form are you is it um part, part of the part of the stories are channeled yeah I, I wasn't I, I've become gradually more aware of that as time's gone on um I wasn't aware of it the, the, the first book um it was more a case of it was it was a story that had been in my head um that was kind of burst out and I'm like, I, I almost didn't have time for that. I just kind of wrote it because I was desperate to get it down. But since then, um, when I kind of stop and think what, what needs to happen there and I find myself typing something and I read back what I've written and it's complete news to me, I had, I had no, I, no idea. So there's definitely an aspect of that. Um, I think part of it's curiosity I kind of ask ask my characters questions. What are you going to do now? And then my fingers start typing, and that's that's what they've done. So they're very much character driven stories, um, and part of it is just things that just ideas that occur to me. I have a notebook that I tend to fill up with notes before I start on the story, just of ideas that I want to include, and part of it comes from that. So it's a it's a bit of a it's a very organic process really I, I've tried to be organized and it doesn't work for me at all I very much I don't know if you've heard the terms in uh, authors tend to be plotters or pantsers which means right by the seat of your pants and I'm I'm kind of a pantser with a few plotting tendencies but plotting a whole story out just doesn't work for me at all because my my characters don't want to be confined in that way so I tend to um, kind of dart around a bit and so where do you feel it's all coming from? And do you feel that, you know, some of, you know, what you've described almost as automatic writing, is that coming from one place and then each of the characters are coming from another place? Like, could they be, and, and I just, I'm just wondering, do you have a sense of that or a feeling like, are these actual beings, spirit beings from another world or are they like, how do you view all that? I absolutely have no idea if I'm honest. I um to to start with, I kind of thought it was coming from Pi, who was the real in infinity, the, the the horse um that inspired infinity. Um 
but then I'm not I'm not sure I'm not sure if it's coming from her or whether she just opened me up so that I could kind of funnel it through I, I'm really I really don't know and I kind of don't I've, I've never really wasted and I say waste I've never really spent any time questioning it I kind of just accept it and run with it really yeah yeah it's interesting too because I know um when you described your writing process, that's kind of what I go through when I'm filming videos of my herd. And I don't have an agenda. I don't have a plan. Mm -hmm. They'll just say to me, get out the camera, yeah. point it this way. So I'm, I'm taking directions at now swing yeah. the camera to Montaro and I don't, and then all of a sudden Montaro will do something or, or Montaro and, and Zora will demonstrate something that's and then the words will come to me about what they're teaching through their physical yeah. bodies. And it's, so it's this very organic process that just kind of unfolds as I follow directions. And it sounds like a, and then you could say, well, let's say this herd transitions, AKA dies, mm -hmm. and they continue to work with me the same way from another realm. Or for example, like three of them, I had to, well, they asked to go north to my friend's farm for a while. And that was to teach me that it didn't matter that they weren't physically with me. The communication was exactly the same. Exactly. It's the same. Yeah, absolutely. So, and, and what is going to happen, isn't it? Regard, regardless of whether you plan it or not, actually, it, what, what needs to happen is going to happen anyway. So you may as well just run with it. Well, that, that's how I kind of go go with it. So in your first book, The Horses Know, um, which w was Pi still alive when you wrote that? Yeah, she she passed just as the second book was about to be published. So she was she was with me physically when I wrote the first two. And so the I'm going to I don't know what you call it, but I would call it telepathic communication. Would you yeah. use that? OK, so in the novel the telepathic communication between Amaryllis and Pi or not Pi <laughs> infinity. <laughs> the, the horse and the girl, the telepathic communication. Was that exactly the same way that Pi had been communicating with you in your real life? At times. Yeah. Um, the, the, the first time it happened, um, there was nothing. No, no, I didn't hear anything in my in my head in my mind at all I um I'd been working with her and she wasn't responding to what we'd been doing as positively as she'd been in the past and I I couldn't figure out what was going on um so I just stopped the session and and let her kind of wander off and she went and stood in the river to cool herself down and have a drink so I just sat on the bank of the river um and then I was very aware you know when you're being watched um that she was staring at me so I kind of looked as if say what you know what thinking she would be at rest but she was very purposefully staring at me um and the the best way I can describe it is that a whole load of information came in through my solar plexus and I didn't actually know what my solar plexus was at the time or or where it was it's, but that's where it came in yeah. um completely through me and it, it took me about three quarters of an hour to um, I knew what it all meant, but it took me about three quarters of an hour to, to put it into thought form so that I could explain it to my husband when I was telling him what what she wanted me to know. Um, and from that point onwards, I started to sort of tentatively think questions to her and then I would hear her, um, I'd hear her in my mind. Actually, that's not true because the, the first time when I first found her at the rescue centre, um, the uh, I was just there fitting saddles, and the the uh, owner of the rescue centre told me about her, and a, a tingle went down my spine because I'd been I'd had images of my next horse, and it was a, a paint horse with with blue eyes, and then the owner of the rescue centre told me that they had this mare there, and a, a tingle went down my spine, um, and I asked to go and see her. And we went down to the field and straight away she she lifted her head and looked at me and straight away I heard in my mind, you're here. But I I didn't realise that was her at the time. Uh -huh. Um it was it was a year or so until that happened that she kind of battered her way in through my solar plexus. 
And after that, I, she started to communicate and I'd hear in the same way. And it was only then I thought, hang on, that ha that's happened before. That happened when I first saw her. I just didn't realise what was happening. Um, uh, and yeah, it was um, the, the, the telepathic communication between Infinity and Amarillo was very much based on um, on, on the, the way that Pi and I communicated mostly for about two or three years. Um, and then after that, it was I, it was at some time before I realised that we'd seem to have stopped doing that. And I, and I think I, it was, I kind of thought at the time and still think it's because I kind of got to a point where she didn't need to say to me, I was kind of, I got to the point where I was in tune with her enough that I knew what she wanted without, without us having to do that, if that right. makes sense. So we, yeah. we kind of stages really. Yeah, it's it's that's so fascinating that you mentioned that. And it's like <clears throat> with my herd, the analogy that I would have is in the beginning, I would be really aware of which horse was talking to me. You mm -hmm. know, well, Kalia saying mm -hmm. this and then Zora said, and then we reached a certain point and it became like group. And it, it was like, does it matter which yeah. like the herd functions as one? They are this you know, that's part of the the thing that herds and pods and whatever are here to teach us humans, because we don't understand oneness and we don't understand how to how to function in that yeah. type of a structure. And that's what I feel we desperately need and what's missing mm -hmm. on this planet. And so it reached this certain point and it was like, I don't need to distinguish who's speaking. I don't need to distinguish who's saying like it it just became irrelevant. Yeah. 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 It's fascinating. Do you think they they separated themselves out in in your mind to start with to help kind of lead you into that? I would I would guess so and mm. possibly I I would looking back I'll bet that my personality preferred that. Yeah. Like I would, you know, like as It's a, easy yeah it's the, and and also we were I got like six wildies wild horses all at once so it helped me to get to know who they each of them were yeah because they spoke in different ways and they um, worked with different themes and so I think it was just part of that process of of understanding them and relationship building and and then when it got to the point where we we knew each other thoroughly it was no longer necessary yeah um and then also too you know when people first start getting to to communicate with animals or trees or anything you know you may have to be really intentional about it and sit down and and do your breathing and get into meditative state and and then after a while as you build that fluency you don't need any of that. No. Although you seem to have just leapfrogged that whole process <laughs> with the boom I, I, to the solar plexus. <laughs> I, I think it's um I think it was more Pi Pi leapfrogged it for me, to be honest. Yeah. I think she was from her point of view, it was a case of I I can't wait anymore. I'm sorry, I've got all this stuff I need to teach her, and she's still in her head all the time and I can't get it through. So poof, she just came straight through and changed everything you know I, I had no idea I, I thought communicating with animals was something other people could do I had no idea that was something that would ever happen to me I it, I suppose I just never entertained the idea that I'd be sensitive enough um so possibly I would never have opened up to to trying particularly but she she preempted that situation and just come on we haven't got time for this <laughs> you need to we need to crack on <laughs> It's so interesting. I wonder too, like, I mean, I, I personally believe that every child before their parents or dominant culture gets to them has the ability yeah. to communicate to telepathically yeah. with everything. Yeah. Um, and then it just depends at what point you got that taken out of your reality. And, and, you know, you didn't, it's just, Someone doesn't have to say anything to you. You just realize that, oh, yeah. nobody else can hear the birds. Yeah. Like maybe, maybe I'm making this shit up, you know? <laughs> yeah. 
it, <laughs> it's, it can be as simple as that. So, yeah. and then I also wonder too, Lynn, if there's, because I've had this happen when I've gone spontaneously into uh, past lives. Like I went, I was just guided. I was in the Valley of Fire in Nevada, which is it's half um, protected public land and half Indian reservation. And I was directed to lie down in this little gully thing. And as I did, everything turned into prana. It turned into like bundles of quark. And then I received a vision of a battle that had happened on that land with the uh -huh with the indigenous American people. And then as, and then as I it finished and I got up and all of a sudden I knew what every plant in the region was for. I just had to put my hand over it. Oh, this is used for cough and you use the root, you boil it. Okay. This one is used. You only harvest in spring. You use the leaves. And it was, and I thought I must've been a medicine woman either here or in a very similar growing region to this yeah. Because I had all that knowledge inside of me and it just needs to be unlocked. Mm -hmm. So for someone like you to go from zero to such fluency, I also wonder if this is not an ability you developed in other lives and it just needed to be activated. Possibly. Yeah. Or, or like you say, I mean, I, I just, I just think everybody can do it when you, when you're given calls to stop thinking you can't, you know, and she just gave me that, that reason to to stop thinking that it was something that was um an unusual ability almost I, th I think everyone everyone can I find it fascinating so continue on I, I no I was just going to say I, I think that that's where horses fascinate me so much because they they as, as soon as you look at them differently and start to even if you look at a horse and think what if I could hear you they they know that and they respond to that and they make things more obvious and I think that's where horses can be so helpful in helping us know who we are who we really are inside that's very true I wonder if they have um a special ability with that because of I mean when you look at the heart math institute the work they've done on the heart field of a horse and how we'll automatically entrain to it. And then our brains will yeah. drop into a pattern that resembles meditative state mm -hmm. just by being around them because their field is so yeah. much bigger and more powerful than ours. We shift to their reality yeah, without even being conscious of it. Fascinating, isn't it? Yeah. It's, and, and I wonder if, if, I mean, as we're discussing it, it's kind of becoming like, well, duh, obviously that's part of what's <laughs> so actually, unique. Needing to be near them as such, I used to find that just being in um, Pai's stable, if I was just in there mucking out and she was, you know, quite a way away out in the fields, I would feel exactly the same thing. I just always found it such a peaceful and uh, uh, not relaxing as such, but just just peaceful as if I had the space there and the rest of the world was somewhere else, just, just as if I was with her, really. That's, yeah. I used to feel that in her stable. So, yeah, I think they, that maybe their energy field is even bigger than, than has been measured. You know, they've measured the, the effect the heart has, but it, possibly it's even bigger than that. Yeah. And I think as well that that can vary from horse to horse. Yeah. Because I find that animals are like humans. They're at different stages of development and evolution. And so you you can't really say, well, all horses are this way. Like Pi could have been an extremely evolved soul. And yeah. that's why she was able to blast through you in one go. And that's why, yeah. you know, her field was so huge and, you know. Yeah. I mean, I, I had her as a four-year-old, but she was, it was like having an aged mare in terms of who she was inside. Absolutely. Mm. She was a yeah, a very old soul. Yeah. 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 And I didn't, I, I didn't get that feeling when I was in any of the other horses stables. It was only hers, maybe because I was more connected with her. I don't know, but I, I think she just had that ability to reach me wherever she was, to be honest. Yeah. Yeah, probably a combination. And then, so then we're back into other lives. Like if you two have worked together, if you yeah. partnered in multiple lives, well, that's yeah. a very strong link that's going yeah. to 
and combined with her being an old soul, (laughs) (laughs) you know, then you would have, have the two of them combined. So yeah, that's so interesting. And did she communicate to you anything about the whole writing process and being written? Because, you know, there's a whole, I mean, there were, there's hard data on how that damages horses spines and especially the traditional way it's done and they don't build them up properly and they don't you know I mean there's ways to make it easier Mm -hmm. but at the end of the day even with just a saddle on those pressure points on the spine there's some damage that sets into so did she ever speak to you about that or did that not come up in your relationship she she didn't um we didn't communicate telepathically about it but she she put me in a position where I worked with the right person who would teach me about everything you just said really so that and and she responded when I wrote her in ways that she was very very clear about a that she wanted to be written because I wouldn't have mind I wouldn't have minded if that wasn't something she wanted to do but she was very very clear that she wanted to be written she was very clear that she wanted to be written a lot Uh, my idea at the time was to ride maybe once or twice a week you know miss a few weeks not you know not just just as and when we felt like it but she was very much that she wanted to do something at least five days a week if not six maybe seven if she could push me but I was it was me that wanted her to have at least one day where we weren't doing anything um and also she was very clear once I was writing her about what was right and what was wrong so that I found the right person to help me ride her um in the way that she wanted to um because you're right absolutely i, I worked with a, a very good osteopath who is an expert in biomechanics and he he helped me to understand that horses are born with a blueprint for health and because of where we sit right behind the shoulders our weight unless we help them can't help but push them onto the, the front end where they can become quite shut down emotionally as well as physically because everything's kind of yeah pushing them down that way and, and closing them down. Um, and she was very much showing me exactly the same thing that she wanted my, which is obviously what I've written about in The Horses, no, she wanted my help to help her to lift her weight up and sit back on her hindquarters so that she could open through the chest and be, be empowered by being ridden rather than disempowered. Um, so that that was that was a, a drive a, a very strong driving force in terms of what she wanted from me in our relationship. She she was very much there to help me, um, but because she she was actually born with downhill conformation, so her the bones her the bones in her front legs were much shorter than the corresponding ones should have been in the back legs. So she was kind of built downhill to start with. Um, she then had a very large foal when she was three, um, which pulled her back down. So by the time she came to me, she was kind of on a on a downward tilt and with her back dropped as well. And she was very clear about the fact that she wanted me to help her to change that posture so that she could sit up and open through and be empowered. Um, and the only way I could, I wasn't a good enough rider to do that at the time. So I, I worked with this osteopath and his wife, who was an instructor. And between us, we kind of helped her to, to get there gradually, as Amarilla does with Infinity in the book, um, to the point where she she was in a level of balance where she was she felt strong and powerful. In order to get her there, I had to make huge changes within my own physical posture and obviously in order to make those changes I needed to change make the emotional changes that would allow me to change my posture so that I could support her so the the, the pairing the, the partnership the two of us had during that time was very much driven by what she wanted from me physically to help her but then obviously in return that's had a lasting effect on me because I've I had to find my own balance and my own strength in order to help her with hers if that makes sense so many questions this is absolutely fantastic okay um so let's let's go back to when you said you had to work on your emotional issues to be able to shift your body 
Could yeah. you walk us through one or two examples of that? So my posture, it, to start with, um, I was always slightly perched forward and like, sorry, you probably can't see, my shot um, curled forward. So my shoulders were rounded and forward. So in a protective posture, really. So I was kind of shut down myself in a, in a self-protective kind of a way. I mean, people who are very confident tend to be very open through the chest, shoulders back, yeah. happy to express themselves. I, I was the opposite of that. I wasn't confident to to express myself um i wasn't i wasn't strong in my core at all because my my pelvis i'd kind of perch on the front of my pelvis and my shoulders were rounded obviously to be strong enough for her to be able to support her through my core and, and with my seat and my legs i needed to be able to sit to engage my pelvis so that she could engage her pelvis to be strong through my core to be open through the chest and have the strength to stay there no matter what happened. So in order for me to do that, I had to release the insecurities and the problems, emotional insecurities and, and lack of confidence in order to be confident enough to, to sit there and say, okay, now I'm here, whatever you do, I'm here and I'm staying here and I'll support you whatever happens so that she then had the confidence that I would I was stable enough to support her through making similar changes. So really all of the changes she needed to make in her body, which was to engage her pelvis, lift up and open and be powerful, were all the changes that I had to make in order to help her to do that. So it was a very productive partnership in the sense that we both helped each other because she would very much highlight any time I wasn't strong or I wasn't where I needed to be she would highlight it in no uncertain terms so that I I, I was so desperate to help and, and to be the rider she wanted me to be I was so desperate to to get better and to improve I pushed myself emotionally in ways I would never have done if if I hadn't been doing it to, to do what she needed me to do and vice versa and I, I was always taken along by her drive she was always so driven to, to do everything she wanted to be ridden if the lorry was ready to go somewhere and she saw it waiting for her she would drag me up the drive and get on it she wanted to wherever we were going she wanted to do that she wanted to get out there and experience it and go full throttle at everything if I didn't ride her she'd she'd come up to the yard gate and just whack on the gate till I came out and tacked her up you know it wasn't she didn't leave it to to wait for me to hear her it was a case of <laughs> you need to get on me and get out now and and she was just very very driven to achieve that um amarillo and infinity achieved it i think within about three months in the book it took me about 15 16 years <laughs> but <laughs> human <there>. time <laughs> gra yeah, gradually got there you know and we got stuck at times in the osteopath if i got stuck somewhere he'd come and help you know release my body say like, okay your body's trying to open here now I'll help it with that Pi's body's trying to do this so I'll help it with that so he'd help us and then we'd carry on and work together and then if we got stuck he'd come and help again so we kind of worked as a team really to to get her where she wanted to go and she did it you know a horse with downhill confirmation I could ride her down a hill but she would still feel as if she was uphill in front of me because her posture and her balance changed and her strength changed to the extent that she could do that. And she was, you know, she would get to a competition and she'd stand at the top of the trailer and say, I'm here, everyone, hello, and just announce to the whole showground that she was there. She was fully able to um, express everything. So, so she, she wanted to compete as well. She enjoyed that. She didn't mind it. It was more because I didn't, I only saw my instructor probably three three times a year, something like that. I found by going to a, a competition and having to focus to ride the dressage test, it highlighted to me the areas where I wasn't strong enough to hold myself and support her. So I just found it as useful feedback more than anything else. Right. And she just was going out to different places. So she was very happy to, to go and do all of that and to announce herself when we got there. <laughs> That's so cool. Yeah. And so the you riding five times a week, did that take place in an arena or out on trails? 
what did she like um both i would i would say i probably did a couple of sessions two sessions maybe riding in an arena i i always did one of those sessions was with her without me riding with her on the lunge or loose just as a way of i would always say to her, okay show me show me where we are show show me where you're strong and where you're not and where what we need to work on so that i could she could move free of everything and just show me where her balance and her strength had got to and she loved doing that she was always very involved in showing where we were um and then the other times would be out um riding we when i for, for most of the years i had her we were in the welsh hills um mm -hmm. so uh, we'd go out for hours the tourists and just go and enjoy ourselves cantering around in the welsh hills <laughs> i i that that's so like my childhood horse um in alberta canada and she would do the same thing she would come and get me and I'd be like nine years old playing with my friends and she would come up and be like, let's go now, yeah. you know, because yeah. we did that. We, we went out and we just adventured together and we rode, you know, half the time yeah. we rode where she wanted to go and the other half we rode where I wanted to go, but it was always this adventuring together in this time. And, and yeah. she was, yeah, she wanted to do it every single day, sometimes twice yeah. a day, she would come and you know, and, and I would be like, but I'm, I'm playing with my friends. She'd be like, now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I, it's totally... so, it, I, I love that. I absolutely love that about her, that the two of us would just disappear off and just um go and have fun. I really, the number of times we'd just sit at the top of the hills and kind of look down the valleys and at the other hills. And I just say to every time, we are the luckiest girls in the world. It's, it's just the, the, the best times I can just I can I'm I'm right there with you I can feel it and yeah. I love the way that 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 whole experience it really illustrates the mirror aspect of the way horses work with us yeah, absolutely. right like yeah <laughs> you know and the healing circle like whose healing is it your healing is my healing is your healing is my and it just keeps yeah. you know and does and we're and then and does it matter no, because... we're, you know we're all the same, aren't we? I mean, we, she and I were just two halves of the the same whole, really. And it was just a, it was a, a way of kind of having something to push against and to react to, to to find our way together. That you know, I I would never have found my way to the where my body is now by myself. I, I would never have done it. So yeah, and and she wouldn't have either. You know, if if she'd been left in a field to graze you know that's some horses want that absolutely want to have a life where they're not doing anything and that's absolutely fine she absolutely didn't um yeah. and if she had been left to do that she she wouldn't have reached she wouldn't have been able to to get to the posture and the, the strength and the, the balance that she did it was very much something that she wanted she wanted me to to do with her it's so interesting because you know i mean I'm not riding any of my horses. Well, not for about six years now, but that's not because I don't want to ride them or, mm -hmm. you know, I mean, Zora was the one that I was riding before. And then we hit a certain point and she's like, I don't want you to ride me anymore. I just want my daughter Zara to, she just wanted her to ride her. And my daughter Zara doesn't really want to ride very much. So it doesn't, it just doesn't happen. Mm -hmm. And then it was so interesting. And then I was talking to my big Belgian mare, Odie, and I was like, I was sending her pictures of how I used to ride my childhood horse and how amazing it was in the unity and our body. And but and what I got back from Odie is she was like, ew, ew, because what I didn't realize, and I was like, I just had shown her pictures of what for me was the most beautiful edifying spiritual experience in my life and she was like excuse me while I vomit and, then, <laughs> and and she was like she showed it to me from her perspective and I realized oh because back then I was a physically abused child so I would get on Dobbin and she would basically morph all her energy up into me mm. and the chains would fall off me and I would feel like I could survive another day. Like she, it was very much this, her transferring her energy to me, flowing her energy through me. She had come to be my support to get me through 
the most difficult period of my life without killing myself. That's a completely different connection and energy and dynamic to who I am now. And I'm like wanting to go back to that as I'm on Odie's back. And she was like, and she said to me, when we ride, we will ride as two queens riding (laughs) together. And I was like, I don't even know what that looks like. (laughs) I do. I I can see it right now. That's going to be amazing. (laughs) Yeah. So where I'm at right now is her saying, um, she told me like two years ago, I've done pretty much nothing about it. Um, She said, you need to, I need to know that you can fall and not be hurt because we can't have you hurt, like seriously injured. Mm -hmm. So I should be practicing rolls and somersaults and you know yeah more jujitsu style things and I've just not been and so and that's so that's where the conversation has stopped it's like well we can't have this riding conversation any further until I do the thing that she's asked me to do she said because you can't make me responsible for your safety yeah I can't I can't do that for you I am a horse yeah something happens I'm gonna go whoop And then if you fall off and then you're now injured for the next month or two, like our work together and what we share with the world is the more important thing. Mm -hmm. And so I can't be taken out of that for a long period of time. That's her concern. Yeah. So I said that what the priority is in your relationship, isn't it? If that's the priority, then, you know, that's okay. Yeah, because for her, it's not like she wants to be ridden or she wants me to ride her. It's more that I would love to ride. I I loved riding. Um, And I always rode bareback. But I, because I had no instructors as a child, I I was self-taught by my horse and and my my own body experience. I don't ride like I see people ride bareback who were first trained to saddle Mm -hmm. and they look nothing like the way I ride. Mm -hmm. What, what, as from that process as a child, when I ride bareback, I am actually all over the horse's back. There's no continual pressure point anywhere because my whole body is in movement and, and, and also moving. Like sometimes I may be more forward, sometimes it may be more back. Sometimes like my legs are in completely different positions. Like my legs wouldn't stay in the stirrup position. And this Mm -hmm. was all, you know, what had come through, you know, intuitively, it's a much more fluid way of riding that, Mm -hmm. you know, which I kind of would like to do just even now to be able to record it, you know, to enter part that part of the conversation. But, you know, it's not like you said, it's not the priority of what's happening right now. The priority of what's happening is, is more what the herd is teaching through the videos that is then going out to, you know, hundreds of thousands of people and really helping them and supporting them yeah. and changing their, their lives. So it's like yeah. riding is like, oh, that would be super fun, but okay. It's, it's not, you know. Yeah, no, I, I don't ride anymore. I haven't ridden since, I mean, Pi, um, I stopped riding her on, the Sunday and she passed on the Friday that you know I, I got realized that that was we'd come to the end of that her, her body she wanted to carry on doing only 20 minutes at a time by the time she was 22 20 minutes was enough and she would stop dead on 20 minutes and say that thank you very much I'd help her to kind of connect and and be where she needed to be and then once I'd helped her to do that that was it she that was fine thank you so I'd I'd get off um and on that Sunday I was aware that it I I kind of got to the point where her body wasn't able to respond well enough for my weight on her to be useful um so I thought no okay that we we need to stop doing that now and that's fine you know I, I know she's not going to want to just retire in a field that's just not her she's too busy so I you know I'll lead her around out in hand and that kind of thing so she still can enjoy that but but she was she went on the Friday. That was that was the end of you know she she got where she needed to go and then that was it. So that was June twenty eighteen and and I haven't felt the need to ride since and I I really don't think I will. I, I think I think riding for me was all about and horses for me were all about 
um, keeping going until I found her so that we did what we needed to do, to do together. And I've, we've still got um, Braveheart, who's behind me, who is the real piece, um, who's my husband's horse. He's 25 now and has just retired from being ridden. Um, and we still have Eden, who's the real flame, um, who came to us injured, as, as she's injured in the book, she was injured in that way, um, but in, in a similar way um, in real life. So we, we've had her, um, and she's she's not ridden at all now. She's with a fr friend on retirement delivery, and that's fine. I just love being with them. I don't I don't feel the need to. I don't miss it at all. I don't feel the need to. It's just. I think you ride if you need to, don't you? And then when you don't need to, then you don't need to. <laughs> but what was interesting in your case was your horse needed you to ride, not mm -hmm. you. Right from the beginning, yeah. you didn't need to ride her. So not constantly. I mean that now I know what I've what we did together as a result of me riding how I very much needed to ride because it was a way I you know I healed and released and cleared and did all of that and strengthened myself so I absolutely needed to ride I just wasn't aware that I needed to I was just very very drawn to her and as soon as she was in my life I just I I'd always felt like I was around horses because I was searching for something and the the, the day that she um was delivered to to me from the rescue center I remember just thinking that's it I don't need to look for anything anymore she's she's here I found her that's it we're you know with, she's the one I've been looking for all this time um wow. and so we did all of that together and I I really think that's what riding was about for me I just don't have any I can't think of a reason to get on a horse now <laughs> I, I think I just did what I needed to do and and that was it I just I just love being with them I we go to see Eden at her retirement home probably every five or six weeks something like that and she's always very happy she leaves the herd she's always very happy to see us and we have a, a lovely time and then when she's finished with us she takes herself back off without, without a backward glance yeah she's like, like yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah yeah and that's that's great I just I just love the time we spend with her so, what yeah. I love about this conversation is it's um we're so going to the deeper layers um beyond because you know because I have a wild and semi-feral herd I have a lot of followers who are you know rabid anti-riding and have mm -hmm. and some of them were riders themselves some competitive and and were horrified at the damage they had been doing yeah. to their horses. And so now they've swung all the way to the other side of saying, there's no riding that's good riding. It all damages the horse. It's all abuse, animal abuse and blah, blah, blah. And at one level of existence, sure, accurate, correct. We have thermography, we have osteopathics who can check the work and blah, blah, blah. But then there's other layers to reality. And what you just talked about in terms of your, that was, I feel like that was a karmic contract. That's like me with my childhood horse. Yeah, and, and right, like yeah. they came for a reason and it was very specific and we had an agreement. And in order, you know, for my childhood horse to remove the chains off me, I had to be on her back. We had to yeah. be galloping free with our yeah. bodies joined in one in complete union. We had a neighbor who, when he'd see us ride out, um, he and his wife, they said, then we would, we would know, okay, you'll be back in about an hour or two. So one of us would keep an eye on the front window because I would always mostly almost always let her run home, which of course you're not supposed to do, but who cares when you're in union with your horse is not an issue. Um, yeah. And they knew that I'd be coming. They said when that was, they just would not miss that for anything because yeah. they could see that when we ran by, they said, you didn't even move. It's mm -hmm. like you were literally one being and it was the yeah. most incredible thing to witness. So they would not like, they would keep an eye on the mm -hmm. window so as to not miss it. Yeah. So if, if, you know, that's a whole other layer of reality. And again, the key here, I think, yeah. is choice. Absolutely. And ask the horse, you know, what 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 would you like from me? What would you like from life? There are definitely horses that don't want to be ridden. Absolutely. There are definitely 
definitely horses who do want to be ridden you know whether for themselves or whether because um they could they feel they can help a rider more that way whatever there's never any excuse for abuse absolutely um and i was definitely a far better rider at the end of the process than i was at the beginning but pi was very very definite that she that that was the interaction she wanted in fact i remember when uh, I was starting her under under tack and everything, she wouldn't countenance me riding her bareback because she she wanted to be very sure where I was and where my weight was. But she was also, as a result, she didn't want me to move around. She wanted to know exactly where I was at all times. And for me to do that, I needed to be in a saddle. So she was quite clear about that. Um, I hadn't intended to, to ride her in a bridle at all. I started her in a, in a rope halter. Um, so my husband was just leading her in the halter around the field and I had the saddle on and I just had my hand in the stirrup and I was just introducing her to what my legs would be saying to her. So a little squeeze would mean this or a little, just from the ground before she had my weight to deal with as well. And she actually came to a stop by herself, turned around and went, <sighs> and even Darren said to me, he said, I think she just wants you to get on. <laughs> And that, that was exactly what it was. She was okay. So, oh, God. <laughs> oh God, I get what you're. I get it. You don't even need to really do that. I'm going to know what you want. What you're asking me to do? Just get on. So I did. I did. I didn't have a, a riding hat with me. I didn't have any no preparation whatsoever. We were on a, on the side of a hill, not not in a, the place that was easiest for her at all. And I just got on, and we just carried on and it was very much a case from her point of view thank goodness at last now we can now we can get going brilliant and so many horses I came across were very much of in, of the same view they they wanted that they wanted me to help their riders to help them strengthen and improve their balance through their bodies and feel empowered that and, and that that was how they wanted to do it so I think I, I agree with you it's choice you know every I would never say horses this or horses that because they're all different and they're all here for different reasons mm -hmm. they're all with different people for different reasons and it, it's always a, I think for me it's always a case of just asking that each individual horse what what they what they'd like what saddle they'd like whether they want a saddle with it, you know everything what what do you want um eden uh who's the real flame she's very definite that she wants a lot of space because she really likes to run and so that's the place that we found for her she's in a herd and she likes to take them with her and actually she's she's doing them a lot of good from the sound of it because um they're all older and some of them are suffering with arthritis but she tends to take them with her whenever she goes off tearing around and as a result they're healthier so yeah. you know that's what she wants and that's what she's got so yeah I, I would agree with you I think it's just about choice and just respecting their choices well and a couple of different thoughts occur to me because you know what you'd said earlier about it well if she'd just been out in a field grazing she couldn't have corrected herself so my first thought about that and then let's so let's reference that with Eden who is like I need to be in a field, but it has to be this environment because I have these requirements for my movement in yeah. that confined space. And I think about my horses, you know, on 160 acres of a wilderness ranch on the side of a mountain, like wow, what wow. they can do with their bodies in yeah. that terrain. And they yeah. have a mix of forest and rock and clay and like they have every terrain they have every surface they have jumps they have so in an environment like that there's a lot more that a horse could do to work out their body and strengthen what needed to be strengthened and um but if you were in you know a two acre flat grass field yeah the horse is very limited in terms of how it could perform physical therapy for its own body and so maybe horses in that situation they do need the rider um because they can't get what they might need any other way D definitely with some horses i mean in pie's case posturally her her nervous system and her body was registering 
that posture that she'd got herself into as a result of her confirmation and then having carried such a massive foal at such a young age mm. her her body had been in that posture for such a length of time that it was registering that as normal yeah. so she needed she needed the stimulation of another body to say just try and move this here a little bit because that's not that's not normal like, you know it's not because you can feel you know you're shut down in front you're like this you're down on your front end you're not you're not carrying your weight where it's healthy for you to carry it for yourself and she knew that but she because it felt normal to her she couldn't feel how to make the adjustment if that would make sense and it was a there were a lot of adjustments that she had to make in order to do that so I think in her case having a lot of space to to run around in and as, as you've just described while she would have loved that and she would have got um physically strong and and fit it wouldn't have helped her to actually alter her posture and almost reprogram her her nervous system and her muscle arrangement if that makes sense to to change her posture the way she did um but you know that's why she that's why she incarnated into a body that met mine you know and and your, your horses need something different and that's why they've incarnated into bodies that have met yours it's yeah. And it wouldn't be, it wouldn't, that's not what I'm suggesting at all, because mm-hmm. when you have a karmic contract, everything aligns yeah. with the conditions for that contract for her to play her role and you to play your role. Yeah. So for a pie, there'd be no way, Oh, put her out of my ranch and she'll be fine. No, she won't because that's not even why she's here. Yeah. <laughs> she's here to work with you yeah. and your body. And yeah. also the other aspect that's coming to mind, um, because what I've experienced with the wild horses and the things that are a lot of what's been wrong with their bodies is from, even though they've had just brief encounters with humans before me, they were severely traumatic. Mm -hmm. And so it's like, and then, and then with one of my horses, Sione, who I'm not sure how old she is, but she sure looked old when I met her. And it was just from that continual, you're a wild horse. You're having a foal every year. Oh my God, does that break down their bodies? Mm -hmm. right? Like they're just never, the body's never given a chance to rest. And I mean, so when I first met her, when she was still at the rescue and I looked at her body and I was like, is she going to be able to birth this foal? Because her pelvis was so messed. Like just, I know you couldn't get within 30 feet of her, but you could just visually see like Mm -hmm. what you described. Here's where she shut down. Here's where she's out of balance. Here's, and that wasn't through humans, that was from the life that she led as a wild horse in the repeated pregnancies and foalings. And so um, my daughter works as a healer and then a friend of mine works as a, as a healer. So I had them both come and work on her at a distance. And that alone changed her, the way she was moving and yeah. made me feel like, okay, she has a chance to birth this foal successfully And, and then, so, and all the work she still, um, well, she's allowed me to trim her hooves a couple of times, which is totally weird, but otherwise still does not want to be touched at all. Mm -hmm. So all the work that's been done with her has been with energy healers and from a distance and she moves like a racehorse. Now she's completely rehabbed herself and, but then she, she doesn't even want to be touched by humans. That's not her pathway. That's not what she's here for. She's she's um she's made sure that she's had having enough interaction with you to get the help she needed to yeah to have the bowl and yeah. But with some of the other horses who had some severe trauma that was inflicted by humans, it's like there's again that mirror that reciprocity things. Humans did this to you. Humans have to take it out. And I've experienced the same thing with the land. It's like yeah. when we either damage the land or we have a damaging event like a massacre that happens on the land yeah the energy from that event it goes yeah. into Gaia's flesh like a tumor or an abscess and it festers there and I think that's again part of the reason our our earth is in so much trouble right now because there's so many abscesses and tumors that and they were put there by humans they have to be released and removed by humans and mm-hmm. this was the work that you know Kalia alerted us to when the first time she said go and sing to the land. And we were like, we don't even know what that means. (laughs) What do you mean sing to the land? 
okay, <laughs> here we are heading out to sing to the land. And then it all evolved from that. And it evolved into the ancestors coming forward. And then um, a whole bunch of trauma from a massive slaughter that had taken place um, in another piece of land. And, and all these things started being unlocked, but the horses knew it was in mm. there and they knew how to, and they knew that humans had to do the work because mm. humans had been the originators. Yeah. So interesting. it's, I, I love this perspective just to, you know, give people because there's, there's so much um, vitriol around the non-ridden thing. And there's also so much self, almost self-hatred happening mm with people who are, are very rabid about that situation. And I hope this conversation can give them permission to open to other layers of reality and perhaps allowing some deeper wisdom to come through and, and some compassion and some forgiveness for themselves. But yeah. along with saying, yeah, this no one's saying you need to ride or I need to ride or anyone needs to ride. We're saying allow for freedom of choice in all things yeah absolutely and and everything that's gone before is just part of learning it's 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 nothing else it's just part of learning and if, if you're learning from that then that it's done what it needed to so there's no need for for guilt or self-hatred or any of that exactly um i want to read a section from chapter seven of the way of the horse to give people an idea of how this telepathic dialogue takes place between the humans and the horses in your book. Um, so this is the protagonist. The main character is a fellow called Newson, but his horse integrity has redeemed him searching for truth. Yeah. Um, and I love that whole, we, we can get into the naming thing later. I love that. I love that device. Let, let's talk about, remind me to talk about that later and how okay. you've got the idea oh, for yeah. that of, of naming each other. Um, but I want to show people how, how this works in your books, because these dialogues, these telepathic dialogues between the horse and the human, they're like, um, they're, I think they're the way that the horse can be the Zen master or the, yeah. the Buddhist monk, the, uh, the shaman, yeah. you know, and, and because they take place within the context of the story, it's instead of just giving platitudes, do this, one should do that. You get to, <laughs> it's, it's so much more meaningful, understandable and actionable when you see these spiritual, like all the things that you communicate in your books are things that are present in every, you know, deep spiritual and meditative tradition. But when they're presented within a context with characters, you go, oh, I get it. Yeah. I yeah. get how that directive is supposed to play out in real life instead of just being an Instagrammable quote that's put on yeah. a pretty background. Yeah. right that you think about and go oh that's so true but there's no relation to your real life there's no relation to your day to day it doesn't that yeah. leap doesn't get made and what i think is so powerful about your books is that people get this fantastic story um with wonderful characters and character developments and plot developments and story arc and everything that's there in a good a good novel but they also get this deep spiritual transmission of wisdom, because when it comes in this way, I think people can really take it in and kind of integrate it into their daily life in a, in a very different way than just reading a self-help book. Thank you. That's really good to hear. I mean, I, like I said before, I, I tend to learn from it as well because a lot of that doesn't come from me <laughs> you know I, I write and then they go yeah <laughs> that, that makes sense <laughs> totally hear you okay so in in the way of the horse um he's found his horse and they've named each other and he says 
slow down. I'll twist my ankle again. If I have to run after you, I called after her. That is not the truth. So this is you, you, her words are, are printed in italics. So we understand that she's commute. She's not speaking out loud. This is telepathic communication. That is not the truth. Of course, it's the truth. Look at the ground. It was covered in cropped grass, completely devoid of tussocks, rocks, stones, any hazards I could see. There'll be rabbit holes everywhere, I insisted. Many of them are invisible until you fall down them. And she says, feel which way is true for that which you need to experience, and you will move with strength and confidence. Doubt yourself, and you will find every rabbit hole that I have evaded. Feel? How do I do that? The same way you explore which plants are safe to eat. I thought about the feeling of rightness that assured me my senses of smell and taste were accurate in letting me know which parts of which plants were edible. Okay, but I can't do that at speed. I'll have to feel my way slowly. I can't keep up with the pace you're setting. Searching for truth. Her thought triggered the part within me that knew what she was about. I hadn't looked for the truth. I had come up with my own and stated it as fact. So I could feel my way at speed, I dithered on the spot. Wanting to go after her, to trust her, and the feeling of rightness that assailed me as soon as I recognized the truth, but afraid to injure my ankle again. She says, the choice between truth and fear will present itself to you over and over. One will strengthen you, the other will weaken you. I was informed as integrity disappeared around yet another hill. Choose fear, and you are more likely to injure yourself, no matter how carefully you tread. Choose our bond, and you will progress. And so this is, I mean, first of all, 100% true. Like all of us know, anything you do, if you're like focused on your fears versus focused on the outcome you want, guess what's happened? You become a magnet. You're going to draw that experience to you. It's, yeah. It has to happen now because that's what you're holding here in the front of you um but also it's like when she says choose our bond and you will progress that for me is 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 like that spiritual transition that spiritual connection right choose because this is with the horse but the horse in this context is your spiritual guidance. It's yeah. the universe. It's source energy. Yeah. Choose that. Yeah. Choose your oneness with the divine and you will progress. Yeah, absolutely. So I, I love that. And that's just a small sample, but that type of dialogue and teaching mechanism is present throughout all of your books and is part of what I think makes them so awesome like just Thank you. next level outstanding and in I know in the horses no and I think that I can't remember there was one other where you map that telepathic process so if people are wanting to get better at communicating with their horse and they're one and it's I mean it's throughout every book but there's a do you do you know what's the other one where there's a lot? I can't remember because again I read them so close um, together. Do you mean um in the horses know where Amarilla is saying um they're my words in my head that are in other words she's putting words to the to the thoughts that are landing in her head, which are really just they're, they're kind of energy when they leave the horse, but she's she's changing them into thoughts and then into words so that she can she can relate to them more easily in her mind yes yeah and yeah. there's there's numerous places where you it's you almost provide like a tutorial for someone who wants to connect at this level with their horse who yeah. wants to enter into this kind of relationship and the telepathic communication so again it's like well you could you know, just keep going out there and trying to connect with your horse or, or meditating in your horse's space. And, or you could read one of Lynn Mann's books and she'll <laughs> walk you through in real life situations with characters, how this is done. And then you take that back out to your horse. 
Yeah, I, I guess so, to be honest. I suppose <laughs> because I didn't consciously ever do that. I wasn't aware that that was what I was doing. Um, I think I remember walking through how the healing, the, the, the singing skills work in terms of resonating your... Uh, using the sound to resonate with whatever it is you're trying to affect and then sending your intention down that way that's again that was when I was curious about how could how would that work and then that's what came out so okay yeah that 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 makes sense that could work (laughs) that's one of the things I wanted to ask you about the whole idea of you have tissue singers bone singers metal singers earth singers water singers like where did that the idea for the concept and because of what I said like Kalia was like go and sing to the earth and we're like what does that mean what is that well how do we do that like where did that whole idea come from really from readings and I can't even remember where just a chance piece about how the pyramids are built in Egypt I knew about, it I, I knew yeah, it yeah I, I, I did allude to that in quite a um a subtle, a, a possibly overly subtle way in the horses know that they, um, they got the inspiration. Yeah, that that's where that came from. Any that anyway, that's where it was embedded in the human psyche to start with. That 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 was possible, just because that's how it embedded in mind. Because when I thought about it, and I just thought, it makes sense to me that that they had abilities that we don't because of all the things that they they achieved. The pyramids, obviously, being a very big example of of that and then I I just got to thinking well if they were to use sound to move the blocks how would that work how would it happen and that's thinking about how how it would how that could possibly work and then well that could extend to anything then if you can use sound to connect and move rocks then you could use sound to connect and and influence anything like why not (laughs) I love it Apparently there are people who use sound to heal as well. I've I've since I've since discovered. I, I didn't know that at the time. Ah. Yes, absolutely. And so first of all, do you are you familiar with the uh the work of Matthias de Stefano? No. <clears throat> so he's from Argentina. No. And once you know his name and you'll you'll probably start seeing him everywhere, especially if you're ever on YouTube and he pops up. But he, um, Gaia.com did a whole series with him as the person who remembers all of his past lives going back to Atlantis and ancient Egypt. And so Mm -hmm. there's a couple of podcasts and whatnot where he talks about singing the stones of the pyramid and he gives some more detailed information on how they did it and, and, and how, I guess the, the, the science of the vibrations, um, the sound vibrations are used. And it's, it's so interesting because if you think about it, like we're already using sound in healing applications with machines. Like I, I have a chiropractor that he has a shockwave therapy machine from Germany And because if you think, well, you can use sound to break up kidney stones. People don't need to have surgery anymore. They just blast the sound in there. Well, this is the same thing. It's sound vibration. It's waveform frequencies. Same thing with the shockwave machine breaks up scar tissue, stimulates all the blood flow and all the cellular processes in the area. Like I had a shoulder where I couldn't put my hand behind my back. And in two sessions, I can go right up like this. And that was after two years of physio and osteo and Cairo and nothing could unlock this shoulder because it was actually Mm -hmm. physical scar tissue that was preventing all the movement. Well, this sound device, vibrational sound, two sessions of it, two 10 minute sessions, (laughs) right? Like, I mean, that's miraculous. Yeah. So we're already touching it now and now imagine if we could somehow figure out as you've represented in your books how to do that through our own voices so you don't need a machine and it's portable and we can take it with us yeah and that's that's pretty cool yeah very cool yeah (laughs) I was walking um my land at the end of last summer and I was doing some fencing and 
a bee would come up and whiz around me in a circle, giving out its tone, its vibration. And it was like, really? Fr- I'm like, what? What do you want me to do? Do you want me? And it's not like it wanted, was trying to herd me. And I was like, okay, I'll just match your tone. As soon as I matched its vibration, it would settle down. Mm-hmm. And then it would just fly gently beside me. Like it wouldn't circle me like this. Mm-hmm. And then, and and I would, and if I stopped, it would start circling me frantically again. So I had to go back to toning it. So over the course of two hours, I have, I don't know, four or five different bees who come to me and do exactly the same thing, but each of them has a slightly different tone that I have to match. Yeah. So as I'm out and walking my land and working on it, I am toning sound vibrations with the bees at slightly different pitches and frequencies. I don't know what that was about to this day. I don't know. Like, why was that important? Why did I like, but my feeling if, when I go into my intuitive feeling of it is I, I, what I, the most sense that I can make out of it is the bees needed me to tune my frequency to the land. Yeah. To connect with my, my thought as you were saying that. Yeah. Yeah. And there, and there had to be that, you know, and I was walking upon the land. I had meditated upon the land. I was speaking to the land, but that level of connection. Yeah. It had to go to the sound vibration. Yeah. It's like, you now have to do this and singing to the land you know maybe that kind of shifts the sound vibrations just shift some of the energies that are lodged there yeah yeah and and probably related to there's been a lot of trauma committed on that land so again like whose healing is it (laughs) whose attunement is it you know yeah does it matter do we know yeah both let me just look and see if I've met, I wrote down some questions. Um, Oh, have you read any of the books by a New Zealand author called Catherine Jeanette, Janae or Jeanette, G E N E T. It's it's her, her way of writing. So she, her topic is basically um, nature and Wicca inspired themes. So she has, her characters are, um a a grouping of they don't call themselves druids can't remember what they call themselves I just labels are not important to me but they do they practice the ancient ways of connecting with the earth and astral travel time travel shape-shifting so in her books exactly like you do through the characters she is actually teaching her readers how to go out and do these things and teaching them the ceremonies and teaching them the rituals. I, like, I feel like I should read her books. <laughs> I think you'd love them. I think you yeah. really love them. They're so good. Um, they're called uh, The Rising, The Gathering. But yeah, Catherine with a K and yeah. Janae, Jeanette, G-E-N-E-T. G-E-N-E-T, okay. Um, yeah. Oh, here's another question for you. I can't remember which book it is. Maybe the one with flame, but the the main character struggles with anxiety. That's um, Quinta and Noble. Quinta, okay. Yeah, yeah and Noble. Um, and then in, in this book, he's, he has hoarding and some agoraphobic. So... These were very specific um, conditions that the humans had in these in these books. And I wondered, did you do research into each of those conditions before writing the book? And what led you in that direction? The hoarding, definitely, because that's not I'm the opposite of a hoarder. I if I'm not using something, then I find somebody who wants to use it and my I, I don't like clutter anywhere so it it was kind of a way of exploring it for me really and 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 looking at the reasons behind it just because it's such a a different um a different concept for me and um in, in Newsom's case it just it, it just seemed like something that would fit with his character because he when I'd mentioned him in in previous books he was very intense and very um 
uh, very stern and very hard on himself about wanting to do the right thing where integrity was concerned. So again, I was just curious about his character and I kind of asked myself, well, if if he's attracted a horse called integrity, that it means that that's what he needs to learn. So what would he have done that, that kind of goes against that and kind of um, almost stealing from his village really was what he was doing wasn't he, he was creating things that he was supposed to share with the village and but then he was he was stealing them that that was a, a way of kind of um getting him to where he needed to get to so that i could explore that side of his character really and um, quinta i didn't need to do much much research into because anxiety is something that i've come across several times in my own lifetime so a lot of how uh, patterns and things that she feels are, are things that I've to a, to a much lesser extent than she has but um the, that that was they were really a, a lot of the patterns in my books with the exception of the hoarding and Rowena it isn't based on that I, I my childhood wasn't like Rowena's but um a lot of the, the issues that the characters are exploring are issues that I've I felt I wanted to explore and look into and really delve into and feel the energy of them and 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 kind of get to not get to grips with them as such because I think I kind of had by the time I wrote them but just explore it more really and almost uh process it and release it is yeah. the best way of it. what's the title of the book with Quinta Noble the one about anxiety a, a reason to be noble a reason to be noble yes yeah. and so I would encourage if anyone is struggling with anxiety and I think after COVID, like how many people were, were and still are yeah. really struggling with anxiety. I think, I think that that book is just so ideal for people to read because it contains such wisdom. And as we discussed, it gives you the pathway out. It, yeah. it coaches you through what to do each time. And just by reading it and reading her doing it in the story, you're laying down those neural pathways and you're strengthening them in the brain. So that yeah. when you yourself encounter, you're going to at some point flash back to the story, flash back to the character and say, oh, I remember. Let's make this choice instead. Let's do this. Let's let's go down that other pathway instead. Yeah. So yeah, I think I, I really enjoyed writing that one because Noble was actually based on a horse I had I used to have um who was with me for 19 years who I mm. but it, yeah he was very very similar character I I saw him in a very similar way to that so yeah I've, yeah I've been very very lucky to be able to write about the horses that I cared so much about it's you know it kind of brings them back to life almost Tell us how the naming process works and the, the symbolism of it, of when the horse names the human and then the human names the horse. Oh, sometimes it happens in the opposite way. I mean, very weirdly, um, my sister said this to me a little while ago. Um, Fern is my alpha reader, my sister. So everything I write, she reads everything first. Um, and she said to me, because she knows how I work and it's quite random I, I wrote the first three books and then I went back and wrote a prequel I think I wrote another prequel after that then I came back and wrote a sequel to the trilogy I, I kind of dot around all over the place mm -hmm. um and yet somehow the names of the horses are always appropriate for who I need them to be in any given story and she said how it's almost like you knew what you were doing <laughs> because she knows that I didn't know what I was doing. But I, I literally, when I came to name particularly the horses, I just think, okay, who is that horse? And then just write the name down and don't question it. And really that's how I've named all of them. Newson, I, it, nobody was more surprised than I was when I came to write that story and he needed to be the son of the new. And I called him Newson right back in book one. I had no idea Wow. Yeah, there in book 10, his name was exactly what I needed it to be for that. And I that that's what I mean. I can't really can't take any credit for that. It looks like I really knew what I was doing and plotting all of those books to meld in with each other, but I really didn't. I just um 
but that's where we're back to the transmission aspect of your writing you know the the connection to source there's there's somebody who knew what all these stories were going to be before I even wrote the first one and just when I said okay who what's this horse called I mean oak gas why would anyone call a horse call a horse gas but and spider as well and yet they were the original ones who whose names needed to relate to that potential of being different aspects of describing the same thing which were you know the the infinite so the infinity gas and spider all you know and why would you call a horse spider and then when I came to think about what a spider does and sits at the center of the web connected to absolutely everything so I think I was intelligent but I really wasn't I just that just came from nowhere (laughs) that's awesome that is so great I love it (laughs) Um, final question for you what do you hope readers receive and learn from your books I think when I when I first wrote The Horses Know, when I released The Horses Know, I hoped that people who hadn't seen their horse in the in that light, in the way that the horse bond did see their horses, might look at their horses slightly differently because that's all it takes for the horses to then respond differently and show them that they're right to look at them that way, if that makes sense. I, I hope that might happen. And I hope that people who already know all of this stuff would read them and just enjoy knowing that there are other people who kind of relate to the world the same way that they do. So I suppose I was hoping to resonate with some people and maybe just um, stimulate the beginning of an idea in in other people who hadn't thought of it that way. That, that was That was my hope when I released the first book. And then really just more of the same with the others. And how many books have you sold to date? I'm just around the 70,000 mark. I think it's, <laughs> it's, hard, it's, it's hard to know exactly. I think my, you're resonating, Lynn. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I think so. It's it's an estimate because the books are in Kindle Unlimited. Um, I, I'm, they're, they're done on pe- the number of pages read. So it, uh, I have a spreadsheet that estimates then how many. Right. Complete books are equivalent to the number of pages read of each book, if that makes sense. So it's an yeah. estimate, but it's around, it's around that. That's amazing. And again, I can't remember the title, but the book where um, the humans are underground. And oh, then Horses Forever. Horses yeah. Forever. The way you mapped the fear and the effects of fear that we've just been living through with COVID and the great yeah. reset. So, I didn't think of it like that actually, but yeah, I guess. Well, that was my question. I was like, were you tying these together? And like, but okay. So no, that was just, again, part of what came through and you went with it I, or. What I thought was um, <clears throat> what, what would fear do to a closed community of people if that was all that was rebounding off the walls, you know, for however many generations, how how would those people end up relating to one another? And and then that's what came out. And and their their naming was very on purpose. Obviously, there was a reason for why they named each other that way because it was a way of gaining, attempting to gain power over one another. Yeah. Um. So their their names, I I um wrote down a list of kind of power names that could be used in that way so that they, they weren't ones that just suddenly came to me but those were the the only instance really that that book is kind of next level and it feels almost like there's definitely elements of prophecy in there and a warning um yeah you know yeah. to say let's bring this into conscious awareness because if we keep behaving like we we have done these last three years like this is where we're heading in the whole the whole safety first movement like that that's the danger of it that's the damage of it yeah absolutely when you put safety and comfort above above not above just living and accepting what happens and learning from it because if if you're only after feeling safe then you're not after learning because learning doesn't happen when you feel safe generally that's in my experience it doesn't you have to be 
out of your comfort zone to really learn things. Yeah, where what happens to learning and growth and adventure and experimentation and pushing yeah. boundaries and pushing limits, like all of that stuff disappears when it's all about safety. And yeah. then safety is is like you said, it's a it's about being surrounded by four walls of fear where yeah. they just bounce off each other and it it constricts yeah. and it constricts and it it further constricts as the things just get tighter and tighter and smaller and smaller. Yeah. And you know, that's what we're seeing in our world today. And then of course, people who have, you know, agendas, they can ride on that energy, take it all the way to the bank because people are then yeah. so easy to manipulate and control. Yeah. yeah. And it's, it's, I think that's a huge piece of what humans have to understand and, yeah. you know, get get out here as the observer looking in and and i think that's what i think that's what the book gives you it it really i, I guess so story enjoyed, i so enjoyed writing that book because um i i just loved setting those people who are very fearful against will who's who's just got no, oh. no fear whatsoever I, I just i had so much fun with that story i really really enjoyed it yeah will is like the 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 wudan master monk it's like you're like, I want to be well. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, absolutely. And his Keep walking that path till I can be well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, it just, uh, I just, I just enjoyed that so much, that book. And I, and I love the cover of that book, I think, just because of the dog as well. The, the dog was based on one of my dogs that I had with me, um, who I, he, he passed at a very, very young age just as he was coming into himself really. And I, I enjoyed that dog's character because I kind of wrote him as as my dog was just coming into to being that dog when he passed. It's almost a way of me, again, indulging myself and living Lovely. a bit with my dog again. So yeah, I really Love enjoyed it. Well, and, and how many horse people don't have dogs? I mean, so yeah. I remember someone on my YouTube channel who was like, again, who had found my videos, knew nothing about horses and whatever. And is like, I have a question. Why do people with horses always seem to have dogs? <laughs> uh, my my answer to that question from my own experience is because the horses bring up everything we don't really want to face and poke poke the really sore spots and say, come on, you're going to deal with that. And then when you're just at breaking point, the dog's there to say, it's okay, I'm here. I'll, come on. <laughs> it's okay, you're okay. <laughs> I love that answer. That's <laughs> so awesome. My experience, that's why I... I've loved having both from that point of view. <laughs> yeah, that is so awesome. Well, it's I'm going to I'm going to share one one thing back related to the fear discussion. And I remember when Montaro, my lead guy, I was out in the field in the middle of nothing. I had nothing in my hands. And I hear these thundering hooves and I look up and he's galloping straight towards me and he said bring it or you're going down and I was like <laughs> and I had literally a few a second to feel the visceral terror that he and I knew he would take me down because he'd done it before in a very light manner just to tell just to show me that I will do what I say I'm going to do because he was I called him my sensei he was like the most advanced martial arts training I've ever had. Cause I did seven years of intensive martial arts training in my twenties. Oh, yeah. So I had like a, a microsecond to be like, <sighs> and then I had to, the fear had to have no place. And I had to bring up my chi, my prana, my key. And as he came towards me, I had to take his, his energy and I had to flow it around me. Yeah. Otherwise he would have taken me down. And, and, I, and then afterwards, I was like, <gasps> like, what are you doing? You know, like what? So he did that to me a few times until I could do it easily. So he and was then your fear. Yeah. And, and it was always when I was in, like, I was too far away to run for anything. There was nothing nearby, like a stick or anything that I could pick up to use as my physical representation. Wow. No, it's like, just use your energy only. 
It's like, yeah. this is relating to, you know, the, the whole conversation about will. And then once I got influent at that, his brother, Jax, who's like a, he's the trickster crazy man. They started charging me two on one. And I was like, and which took it to another level because Jax, I don't trust with good mm-hmm. reason. He's the trickster. So that took it to another level. And then once I mastered that, Juno, his son joins him and there's now <laughs> three on one. And I'm like, what is going on here? Like, what are you, and then I started to get a little freaked out. I was like, what are you preparing me for? Like, what is going to be happening that I need this level <laughs> of mastery over fear and ability to flow this violence and aggression that's coming towards me? And it, like, it was crazy next level. Um, but it reminded me again of, of what happened in the book and the way Will would handle things and the way the mm-hmm. other people would watch him handle things in such a different way and continually choosing to be fully in a different reality. Yeah. And that's it, exactly. And then especially where fear is involved, because it's it's not the strongest of the emotions. It, you can make it very strong, but it's not the strongest of the emotions. I think especially when fear is involved, to have someone who behaves like that, it's hard not to be drawn into that with him which is obviously the horses helped him but that was what ended up happening but yeah it was a huge amount of fun Mm -hmm. so transformational that book well thank you so much lynn for all your time no thank you i've really enjoyed talking to you thank you very much it's been absolutely fantastic and um do you want to tell us what your website is it's linman.co.uk. Yes. And all of these books, all 10 of them are available on Amazon. Are there any other main places people can get them? They're, they're available through bookstores as well. They're unlikely to be on the shelves, but the book, any good bookstore will order them. Can order them. And the first yeah. one, again, in the series is called The Horses Know. And I do strongly recommend starting... I mean, you don't have to, the the books definitely stand alone, but I think for maximum enjoyment and also for this instruction in the telepathy and the spiritual transmissions and stuff, I think if you can start with the first book, The Horses Know, I think that would be ideal. um, Yeah, or or the prequels, actually, that they can be read beforehand, but yeah. The prequels you could, yeah. Yeah. Okay, so So let's ask you that. Which book do you think people should start with? Um, some people find the prequels first and choose to start there. I think most people start with the horses know um, and are glad they did. So I, I would normally say start there. Yeah. Yeah. Excellent. Thank you, Lynn. And I look forward to uh, to seeing what comes out of you next. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Who knows? <laughs> Thank you um, very much. Thank you. <laughs>